Hello, and welcome to the Mad Palace podcast. We are a group of writers of varying backgrounds, publication histories, experiences, and genres. Our goal is to talk about stories, writing, and books in general. I'm Jennifer Flath, author of the Black Pearl series, a young adult fantasy adventure, and I'll be the host of today's episode, which will focus on characters. First, let's see who we have as guests. I'm uh, Andre Clemens. I'm the author of well, a lot of things, really, but mostly known as the author of The Lake Giants and the sequel, Welcome to Lake Luna. It's all about all the creepy little things that go on in a small southern town and one girl trying to make sense of it all. And I'm Eden Ng. I'm the author of The Chronicles of Terror, a fantasy web serial novel series. And I'm Ryan Watts. I am a author of the web serial Flocked, a fantasy fairy tale action adventure series. And I'm Laura Morrison. I'm the author of How to Break an Evil Curse, um, which is a humorous fantasy. Awesome. All right. The topic today is You're So Vain, You Probably Think This Character is Based on You. And the sort of introductory question is pretty general. How do you create your characters? Well, or do they... Do they, uh, your characters like create the themselves? Characters, yes. That's kind of where I go. I just sort of start with a character, sort of. Just a vague idea for a character. And then they, they really do, which sounds kind of flaky, but they do sort of create themselves. And I don't think I'm alone in that. Oh, no, you're not. Definitely not. Yeah, I don't, I never go, like... I don't really think that my characters are based on anybody in real life, except accidentally, generally. I mean, I think all my friends and family know that 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 they have the opportunity to become a character at any point, at any time, so they already know that anything is fair game, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, but sometimes when you just write in the story, just the, this, the way you're creating the world of the story, characters are kind of slowly form like the bare, you know, like the bare bones of characterizations will start to like come from the storyline. You'll just start it's almost like play doh. You just take the take this basic character blob and you just kinda of work out of it and you just start to mold it and it starts to develop into something and it just kinda of grows up from there. So it's kinda of like character childbirth in a way. I guess character yeah. childbirth. Yeah. Registered trademark by the way. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I'd agree with that, too. I mean, with me, since a lot of what I write is adaptations or retellings of older stories in one way or another, you know, I look at the original character, whether it's a, it's a very bit small character, only like a half a page of one story, um, or someone who's more complicated, and try to see, well, what is the core of that character, and then what do I want to build off of that? You know, what's, what's going to make them more of a, of a three-dimensional character? You know, so when you go from you know, the, the butler in a, in a fairy tale to turn them into a full person, well, who is the full person? Uh, and eventually, as, as you were all saying, they become their own person. They can they kind of tell you who they are, um, you know, where all of a sudden, you know, you're learning things about them that you never had any intention for, but it comes actually from, you know, what you've already built up for them. But I, I don't think it's always that formulaic because um, for most of the time, I don't actually create any characters, they just sort of either pops in and just exist, or they were already somewhere in my head, and then they just carried on. It, it's it's not as if they were. Uh, I I I put like a name, and then I give them personalities, and they start start putting building them up like Django tower, Django blocks or something. I am um, yeah. I usually start with plot, I think. And then I think about what kind of a person would be the most fun to throw into that sort of situation. And then I think about what that character is lacking and what types of people will bring out sort of more levels in them. I, I don't think I don't think most of this is conscious. I don't do this on purpose, but that's sort of what I end up doing. I start with plot first and then what kind of person would be the most fun to throw into that situation yeah. definitely yeah you know and, and for me I, I there's there's times where i go that route where there's the plot first i, I know i want to have this plot 
this idea the, and, and go build the characters from there. And I find with, with short stories, it's almost always character first. Um, whereas for longer projects, it is more the, the plot first, character second. Um, so the fun question Andre kind of got here. Have you been accused, fairly or unfairly, of writing yourself or others you know into your characters? Well, guilty as charged. I mean, <laughs> as, well, sometimes it doesn't happen like on purpose, though. Like I find myself when I'm writing, like say, uh, the you know, the Lake Giants, where sometimes Skylar Green will say something, and it sounds more like something that I would say, or you know, or, or I'm writing, like say, Mass Mouse or some other character. And sometimes, it, I guess, it's like characters tend to sometimes talk the way you would talk sometimes, and you don't do it on purpose. It just kind of uh, you know comes out like that. And and the problem is. That is that when you like multiple stories, you, you, you want to try to make sure that all the characters don't start to sound alike. Like sometimes I'll write like the Lake Giants and Skylar Green will start to say something that Mass and Mouse would say, and Mass and Mouse sounds like some, to say something that you know <laughs> uh, that Lexi would say, and it's almost like I don't say you're trying to fight your own creative voice with other characters. If that makes sense. Oh yeah, definitely. One thing I did back in high school and college uh, before I really was trying to to write things that were my own that were someday publishable, I took my actual literal friends and I'd write us into short stories. And that way I could practice writing characters that weren't me, that were them, literally. And it got to the point where folks could read themselves and say, yes, if I was in a situation where we were being attacked by barbarians, that's what I would say. And from that, that helped me a lot to create characters that were definitely not myself. Do I now turn my friends into characters? Almost never. Uh, I'm always accused of that. I have friends who won't read my stuff because they're convinced that I'm going to write some complete tell-all novel about the all the intricacies of their love lives. No, not going to do that at all. <laughs> not my thing. That would be dangerous to do. Very, very dangerous, the knowledge that I have. Uh, but season characters, yeah. Ideas that they have, you know, things that they've done in their lives, anecdotes... Those I mind sometimes, but no one character in my works are ever actually literally one person I know. Um, they're probably a gestalt of dozens and dozens of people I know, if anything. So it's almost like you know taking bits and pieces of certain situations and kind of incorporating them into the stories. Well, if it if it works with the character, yeah. So if I'm creating a character who is a you know a, a dot com tech person, let's say. You know, I create the character from from scratch. We talked about earlier figure out who they are and what the kernel ideas are, what their strengths are. And then as I'm writing the actual piece, if I can recall, oh, yeah, here's something that a friend of mine went through and told me once and it resonates with the story. I might make my own twist on that for that character. So I drop in ideas from the real world into that character, but it only makes them more fleshed out as opposed to being the basis of them. You know, it, it's more the 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 details the the ornamentation not the actual base of the tree i am about writing yourself into a character i actually find that the closer a character is to me the harder time i have making that character interesting (laughs) (laughs) i accidentally stumbled into that problem in one of my most recent books i realized i was writing a character that had a lot of similarities to me and i was just I, I I sort of hit this wall. Like, well, I don't know how to make this person interesting. But, <laughs> I, I find that when you're writing characters that are, uh, um, I I do a, a bit of first person writing. So whenever I would write in first person, I feel like I, the the voice of that character is can be stronger than when I do in third person. It's uh. I, I do put more of my own voice in it, so it might resonate better than uh, my other uh, characters when I'm writing in a other form of narrative that's not f- f- first person. Yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely the, the joy of first person narration is you get much deeper into a character's head. Uh, I find that my third person narrator is oftentimes too close to me. So that's why I do enjoy Casey dabbling in in first person. It, in, in that case, it, it's all it's almost as if when we are narrating in third person, um, we are the character of the narrator. 
Oh, very yeah. much so for how to break an evil curse for the, the story I write. My my narrator is probably very much more close to me than any character I've ever written, I would say. <laughs> my char- I, I write a lot of characters who are like, quote unquote, like snarky women. And I think people assume that that's me because I write them so often. But I think that's more what I... Like, I'm one of those people who, after the fact, I come up with what I should have said in any given situation. My characters are more able to think on their toes in that way. So, yeah, I'm with you there. Just half thought there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, a good friend of mine who recently read through Flocked and The Soldier would comment to me while we were hanging out how he'd read certain lines, certain one-liners, and you know, could just tell that it was me. That it was a line that I really, really wanted to, to add in there. And my argument to that was, well, no, I, I started to use more and more of those kind of one liners in real life because I'm writing them more often. You know, it, it's in a weird way. I've become the narrator as opposed to the narrator becoming me, um, where, where that narrator's personality is becoming more of my own. Oh, that's a, that's an interesting side question when you are writing something do does that bleed out into your real life like are the characters you're living with (laughs) are they affecting your life all the time but i think that's just because i'm insane (laughs) (laughs) well well, we're all insane so we're writers you're you're in good company (laughs) oh that's fantastic (laughs) <laughs> to to varying degrees. I mean, on a on a small level for me, yeah. There there's times where I, I will start to use characters' voices a lot more often uh, in my real life, and then there's times where, as you guys may have seen earlier in the video, where I literally find one of my villains is now a painting on the wall of my room. Um, <laughs> I, I literally now have a giant vulture man painting hanging in my living room that's not mine that just appeared there one day. And it appearing shortly after writing a villainous vulture man into a story was a little disturbing. You should probably mention that you have a roommate. I do have roommates, yes. Otherwise, that is really one of them. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think that's the story story for quite a while until I asked them. It just disappeared one day in the living room, and I'm like, "What is this? Why is there a giant vulture man in my room?" That is super spooky. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a story right there in itself. Oh yeah, vulture man in the room. I think I think it's next story arc of Flock right there. It, it literally, like it literally is Andre. The next stories. story arc of Flock is involves a a villainous bird, a villainous vulture, and when I finish drafting it, the next day this painting appeared in my room. So yeah, there are times where fiction will bleed over in my real life, and it's kind of disturbing. But it showed me how powerful that character was. Where you know, just seeing this 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 similar design invoked in me all these emotions of, of you know, th- that that character should have evoked in someone. So it was kind of nice in that way. Is there a, a character or a line or a scene even, but focusing on characters that you, you can admit and recognize was exactly a situation you had been in or a person that you know or had just talked to? Have you ever done that before? Oh yeah, my friends got cryogenically frozen last week. <laughs> <laughs> Yours too. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. Uh, situation. Right, what you know. Situation wise, it's really hard to actually say that. Oh my, I I'm writing this story about being cryogenically frozen for a hundred years because I know someone who got frozen for a hundred years, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Lines wise, it's uh, I I'll be honest. I steal quite a lot of lines from TV shows that I watch instead of people that I know, because people I know just aren't that good, great with lines. But you know, I I, I take bits and pieces from uh, shows and games, uh, lines that I like, and I just say, oh, that that concept is nice, um, and I think it's something a character that um. That I write within this um, 
within this personality would say so i would maybe modify a little bit and just just use it as my own which is i guess it's plagiarism in in a very very <laughs> far sense <laughs> I think I think you can take a well. I don't know. People are trademarking phrases like crazy now. Yeah, it's, it's a shame. I I don't understand the trademark. Nobody's that phrases. original. It's that's crazy. Yeah, it I, is crazy. I don't understand it either. Accidentally stealing from everyone just because we're all so immersed in our culture that there there are just certain things that. Nobody is that original that they are truly the one who has come up with any idea ever. I mean, anymore. If, I think. If, if someone started trademarking, I'll be back. That, <laughs> what what are we gonna use to signal that we'll be back? Right. <laughs> well, I'll be it's like soon. it's like the I don't even think I can mention it. You'll just have to bleep it out. The song "Happy Birthday." You can't technically sing that. You can now, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah, you right. can finally. Whew, okay. Yes, there was a uh, within the last year, I believe there was a court case that finally proved that the, that the original copyright has expired. Oh. So we we're finally oh, free. Man. We're free to just sing that awful song. Free. I think you're talking about like certain like. Have you ever used like? I think the question was like, have you ever used like certain lines or situations from yes. like, other places or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, I, I find that. I mean, sometimes like say we do use from friends. Sometimes like. There are times where there's some characters that tend to like write themselves. You know, when writing Mouse on the mic, I've realized that Madison Mouse is a character in which I don't even have to try to. It's almost like writing her is like not even a chore. It's almost like I, I you just sometimes when you have like two characters characters in the room, you can like the dialogue can just go on for like days and days and days because it's like there's just so much material. I have a couple I mean, of story villains that are off doing their own thing and I swear to you they make up these plans themselves and all I do is deal with them and yes. as crazy as that sounds they th it's their fault I can't take much responsibility I have the same thing with villains villains are so I don't know they, they're so clever they I swear they they do their own planning I agree. And it's funny for me though when a character is I'm oh, sorry Go ahead, Andre. It's almost like, I don't know about y'all, but it's almost like, some, for me, like, writing villains is almost, like, easier than it is to write, like, good guys. Like, you could, like, you could write, like, evil dialogue, like, all day, but when it comes time to write, like, good guy dialogue, it comes, like, very hard. Yes. So it's, like, it's easier to, for me to write bad, to write about bad people than it is about good people. And they're so fun, I don't know what too. that says about me. <laughs> a lot. You're not alone, at least. It's, it's freeing. It's freeing to write a villain because villains can say and do things again, like you said, that we would never do. So you can sort of indulge that, you know, those things that are taboo. And going to the point of a character's right themselves, the character for me of Tarie is like that, where she was the character I had the least idea of personality for when I first started working on Flocked. And when I got to her focal point character chapter around, was it 18 or 19? All of a sudden, she is clicked, and she is now the easiest character and the most fun character to write because it's effortless. She just writes herself constantly, um, and I had to actually limit how much I use her sometimes because it's too easy just to make everything Taria, and it's great and easy. She's so cute. <laughs> it's worth it. Do it. Just change the whole series. Do it from her point of view. I love oh, that. That could be brilliant. I would read the. Sh I. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to swear on the podcast. <laughs> it's our, it's our, it's our podcast, rules. <laughs> so we make. You just have to add a little e next to it. Oh, yeah, I love, I love my villains so much. They definitely have more of a tendency to write themselves. Like my all-time favorite character for just writing himself is well, either either Farland Phelps, the evil wizard, or my pirate uh, Maximus McManly man. He. <laughs> I would just, I could write him forever. I love him. Both great characters. Best. But I think for me, like, the the characters that are easiest to write are those that are as far-fetched as possible. So, yeah. Uh, like, for my uh, Terra series, um, it's the Watcher, which is an impossibly old human being with the powers to control all of time. And uh, that's... 
and uh, that is the that, that's the easiest to write in, in that it, it just flows out and in the new in the new story um, uh, deck of clover the easiest is uh, this character called Fornelia Chantavalica which is uh, shortened to 4chan uh, and her personality is just out there to the point where it's it, when I write her it's just she writes herself because th- there's no other reference for these kind of characters uh, in normal day lives. You don't have to look back at like say someone that exists and say oh that's how I think this character will work because these characters are the only uh, reference of that character that exists perhaps in the world. Yeah, I I agree with that. I I don't. There are sometimes when I get accused of um, this this character is this person in my life. Not not very often, but um, for the most part, no, I'm not doing it on purpose. They really are just these people, and the less like they are people that I know, the easier time I have writing them. So, I agree. Um, So, you guys, uh, Ryan, Aiden, Andre, you guys all have to juggle a lot of characters. Ryan and Aiden, you have a lot of characters in one project that have to battle for screen time. And Andre, you have a lot of different genres. So, I guess two different questions. How do you you guys deal with um, so many different people trying to I don't know battle for page time and then for Andre how do you switch from genre to genre and the type of characters that go in um, yeah so with with Flawed, with having a lot of characters the way I view that is I think about a particular arc of chapters or or even just one specific chapter and I think who who is a good point person to anchor that chapter or that arc whether it be, uh, you know, Oleg taking on five or six chapters about his own point of view, pushing forward his story, and what characters can I add on to that, and what characters can I allow to sort of take the back seat. Uh, typically within each volume of, of Flocked, there are, you know, about five to seven shorter arcs within it, and I make sure that each of the main cast members is present in at least one as the central character and is absent for at least one that way I can kind of balance out characters that way and, and have people take turns um, who is more in the lead and who is kind of falling more in the background, but keeping in mind as a way that I can have, you know, Oleg's arc resonate with Tari's arc. Then I I'll bring her in a little more at that point to give her that, that, that chance. Uh, and so I can kind of pepper the background of, of chapters with fun little one-liners or interesting notes with other characters so that folks can kind of see people they like a lot more, um, more often, even though they're not the focal point character for a couple episodes. And uh, I think for me, the, I think you were talking about like different genres and whatever. I guess for me, it would be boring if I just worked on like one storyline. So I kind of like try to challenge myself by doing different you know, genres. Like when I first did you know, The Lake Giants, I wanted to do something that was different from Mouse Hunter Mike and the Bailey's Eyes and all the other stuff. And so I like, I've never really done like a horror fantasy. I, mean, well, I guess Bailey's Eyes is kind of a horror fantasy in a sense, but I said, I do something that's really out there with the Lake Giants. So that's why that first chapter is like them, you know, in the wilderness and they do the whole ghost story and the ghost is chasing after them. And that's kind of a, I think that first chapter was almost like an experiment is to see, you know, this is something different. Let's see what happens. And so I guess with with each story, I try to like you know challenge myself, try to see. That's why I kind of throw in different characters and try to mess around, see what works. So it's always like a work in progress, trying to like yeah. not just entertain readers, but trying to entertain myself in a way. How do you do it without just um, porting the same set of characters over, or does that happen naturally, or is there a character type that does pop up in your different works? Yeah, I mean, do you we, notice we, a we, type we, of person showing up? Well, it, if it is, I'm not completely aware of it. I, I just, I guess we I think we're talking about what, what I think somebody said earlier. Like, just write characters that are, they're like interesting to you. You know, just as far as like which which character story, which uh, the personality tra- do you most admire, or which personality traits 
you kind of seeing yourself and just kind of write for that. So if me and my protagonist kind of act similar in that way, then I guess that's kind of a character type. But I'm usually not really aware of it until the story kind of develops further along. I do have characters that um, that do seemingly reappear every story. Um, there's one very obvious one, but he doesn't count because he's a time traveler. Uh, but I, 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 I like writing these this um, uh, female uh, sylph-like character. It's a very uh, uh, almost sensual but powerful female uh, independent individual that appears, I think, almost uh, in everything I try to write. It's just a kind of character that I like writing because it's uh, so... It's not... I, I personally don't find it common in, uh, in mo- most modern fiction works. Um, as for the number of characters I write, um, I think I have the most main character at any one single time in the book right now, which is uh, 14 for my for my newest serial novel. And you consider them all main characters? Yes, they, they are all main characters in the same sense that they, they, they have the same... Um, uh, level of intrigue within the plot they have they all contribute right. to the same level and even though they might not all share the same amount of screen times but if you consider main characters the 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 characters that drive the plot the, the characters that are at the forefront the characters that take um, a narrative um, precedent in the story then yes those 14 are all main characters um Originally, when I wrote this story with all 14, I could not get it to work properly because um, there were just too many of them. Um, before that, the highest amount of main characters I ever wrote was 6 in one story. So 14 was pushing that quite far. Um, but uh, after that, I started breaking them into parts and I had to format the story in, in a way where each character doesn't overlap um, another storyline so it took a lot more planning and uh, technical uh, the, the art of actual story writing comes in here you know where you don't want all 14 characters to um, bang heads at the same time but you yeah, want and you don't do note taking so this is all happening in your head yeah <laughs> yes they are it's all happening in my head oh, like, wait, no no taking yeah um, you might be the craziest one I... <laughs> <laughs> it's not a competition in the mad palace we're all the craziest ones <laughs> equal opportunity craziness i've been here yeah but I yeah, yeah, what was that the craziest <laughs> uh, Wait, but what was that about? You don't do any note taking, like so when you so when coming up with the stuff, it's just like from your I, mind straight to the computer. Yeah, it just straight in. I mean, um, I take very brief notes for things like um history and laws, but those are just very brief summary, almost less than uh fifty words per note. So if you're thinking like note taking, like each character has its own biography profile and stuff no it's all it's all in my head from head to pitch oh wow yeah it it's not as as, as impressive as it sounds <laughs> most of the time is most of, most of the time it's just a mess until <laughs> until it gets out of the pitch and then it stops being a mess yeah but uh that's that, that, that's the process for my characters and uh when people say that they feel they they like like the topic of the of, of this podcast is that um, you're so vain you think the character is about you and when people do think that the character is about them I, I I take it as a kind of compliment because it just means that they're realistic enough to actually feel like a person. Oh yeah, good point. That obviously you're trying to write real people, so if you've done a good job, it's going to resemble someone there's someone out there that's going to feel like i would do that in that situation Hmm. i like it yeah 
Well, we have to wrap up. So is there anything that you guys didn't get to say that you are dying to say before we stop cold turkey? I like pie. Thank you. <laughs> I do too. Yeah, I like pie. I've lost my taste for cake, but I, I still like pie. Brownies. Brownies are better. Yep. I like brownies with um, raw cookie dough on top. That's the best. Ooh, I've not tried that. They're right. amazing. <laughs> Just yeah. make cookie dough without eggs, basically. And use mini chocolate chips. Because when it's cold, it's a lot easier to bite through a mini chocolate chip. <laughs> no, that's a note that I will make. <laughs> anyway. So, this was the Mad Palace podcast. I am Jennifer Fleth, author of the Black Pearl, mostly. You can find me on Facebook at um, the Black Pearl series or on Twitter at Jen Snork. And Andre? Okay, I'm Andre Clemens, uh, author of The Lake Giants, Welcome to Lake Luna, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, uh, you can find me on Facebook at Andre Clemens, very original, I know. On Twitter at Andre C, that's me. Uh, my stories are featured on Juke Pop and Wattpad. And I have a website that will be updated in the weeks to come. All yeah, right. but I'm all over the place, basically. All right, um, and I'm Eden Ng, um, author of the Chronicles of Terror series. You can find me on uh, Facebook uh, at Eden Ng Author and on Twitter at Eden underscore Ng. NG. And I'm Ryan Watts. You can find me on Twitter at Guild of Feathers. Uh, and uh, from there, you can find links to my various stories. And I'm Laura Morrison, author of Come Back to the Swamp, which is available to read for free at jukepop.com. How to Break an Evil Curse, which I will be self-publishing in late 2017 or early 2018. And I'm also author of an as-yet-unnamed sci-fi book that will be published through Space Boy Books in late 2017. You can find me on Facebook at Laura Morrison, Writer of Stuff, and on Twitter where my handle is Pony Riot. Awesome. Thanks for showing up, guys. See you next time. All right, bye. Bye. You haven't been recording any of this? We've been so brilliant up to this point. Well, you know, and... What was I going to say? Skip me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Bakery Illuminati made it into the podcast, so <laughs> nobody but us will suspect. Oh, they didn't hear that? Oh. Yeah, it, it was too random. I, I, I couldn't find a way to put it into the podcast without it's used. You know, oh, like, suddenly it there's Baker's Illuminati coming out. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a running joke for me like all for weeks now on face on Twitter. It's not gonna make any sense now. <laughs> I'll I'll try to put something about the Baker's Illuminati. <laughs> right, this podcast is sponsored yeah, by Baker's Illuminati. <laughs> yes! Yes. <laughs> and don't explain it. Just say that. Just say that. Yeah. <laughs> Just say that. Only the important don't people will know what it means. That's right. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Ryan has turned into a ceiling. That's the first time I've used that. Oh my gosh. Hey, Ryan. A real person. Awesome. Hello. Oh, he disappeared. And he's gone. It's, a, it's an indie press that um, Sean... I don't that's know how to say his name. Grolkowski. It's, it's weird that we've known we we've sort of known Sean for years, but we still can't pronounce his name properly. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been in a situation where I've had to say it out loud. Right. Space Mantis. Oh. Space.